and welcome to Galley Stories, stories of the Bering Sea and beyond, hosted by Mark Kaler. My name is Penka Jane, podcast deckhand and longtime listener. We'd thank you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. Here's today's catch. Hello guys and welcome back to another installment of Galley Stories, stories of the Bering Sea and beyond. I am once again your host, Mark Kaler. And today we have Captain Lance Kramer with us. We are sitting in Kotzebue, Alaska. How are you today, Lance? I'm doing good. Great. See, end, end of fishing season, so tired. It is. We've got uh, what, four days left. Yeah. Four days left. Yep. Um, Lance, where were you born and, and, uh, and what was your upbringing? I was born right here in Kotzebue, Alaska in 1971. And uh, my mother is an Eskimo woman from here. She's part of the Gallahorn family. And then, of course, my dad is a... German fella, he's from state of Washington, so from Tacoma, Washington, and so he came here with the Air Force Base in '67. They met together and danced on the floor to the Bee Gees, you know, and and the uh, rest is history, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so you stayed here your whole life. Did your mom and dad stayed pretty here? much. Um, you know, I was born and raised here and uh, lived a subsistence life. My father knew how to hunt and fish and trap. And then, of course, my Eskimo side of the family, I was able to hunt and fish and trap quite a bit. So, um, yeah, and then it wasn't until junior high that I was able to go to Seattle and play football for, for uh, Washington High School. So oh, cool. I've always wanted to play football. My father played football, and we play on the streets here in the winter and, um, you know, watch it all the time, of course. But um, Seahawks? Yeah, 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 Seahawks. Jim Zorn. I used to have a Jim Zorn poster in my, in my room. You, you touched on something right away that if I could get you to expand it, when I mean expand, I mean really expand on it, the uh, subsistence way of life yeah, and, and that upbringing. What, what are some of your earliest memories and some of the traits that you learned? Oh my goodness, camping. We'd spend the whole summer across, uh, 15 miles across the sound here, a place called Sisolik, which is a place where you get belugas. Sisolik is a beluga, so Sisolik is a place where you get belugas. So we would um, uh, hunt there from spring till fall. You get squirrels and ducks and trout and salmon, seals, caribou. And so subsistence is just a way of putting food on the table that you normally otherwise wouldn't get from the store because things are so expensive here in Kotzebue. Uh, the only way food comes in is through barge or plane, mostly through plane. And so quite expensive. You know, frozen turkey at AC right now is 98 bucks. A gallon of milk is $9. Uh, bag of cereal I think is like fifteen dollars you know it's K cups for Pacific bold you know coffee a hundred of them is geez Louise I think 75 bucks so things are so expensive and you gotta be able to offset that by getting food from the land uh, so a lot of subsistence fishing and hunting now you said your dad taught you that yeah yeah he taught me quite a bit about um, small game big game hunting he couldn't teach me about the ocean hunting, the seals and whales and things like that, because he's white and, you know, it, the ocean hunting for the sea mammals is only for Alaska natives. There was a, a Marine Mammal Protection Act passed in 1971, and it says really only natives could, uh, you know, hunt those. So he couldn't teach me that, so I had to learn from local natives here, and then and then eventually go out myself. So, yeah, it worked out. Is this something you still practice today? Do you oh, still yeah. go after seals and after oh, belugas? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to. Yeah, we get big bearded seals in the spring and dry their meat for food, and we render their blubber into oil, and that's the major condiment for everything else, for caribou meat, for salmon, for whatever. Throughout the whole year, seal and seal oil is our main food source. Probably second is caribou. Third would be salmon and uh, moose. And then she fish, probably for Kotzebue area. So you said uh, it's your main condiment. So you treat the seal oil when it's rendered down as a dipping sauce. Yep. So to put it in context, most would understand soy sauce, butter. Kind of like I, I would I would liken it to what what olive oil is to Italians, right? It's everything, and that's what seal oil is to us. You just have jars and gallons of seal oil in your freezer and uh, and then whenever you're ready to eat you just take some out and put it on your plate you have some dried seal with it you have a roasted caribou with it you know and you dip it into that oil with some you can put soy sauce in there you can put Worcestershire sauce in your seal oil uh, some you know whatever but salt and just dip it in and eat it and uh, 
your caribou meat, even though it might be a little bit dry, but when you eat it with seal oil, it's really good. So just uh, super healthy for you. The um, seal meat itself has a lot of iron. Any, you know, iron as an element is an oxygen grabber. It grabs oxygen molecules and hangs onto them. And so seals have a lot of iron because they need oxygen grabbers for diving a long ways. So their meat is very dark, full of iron, kind of like pronghorn might be, or quail, or ptarmigan. So same thing with seals. And so this iron is really, really important to us up here. A lot of protein, a lot of iron in seals and in caribou and in moose. Um, and then of course the berries, we have salmon berries, blueberries, blackberries, cranberries. But the salmon berries, one cup of those has the same amount of vitamin C as eight oranges. And so instead of buying oranges from AC for 30 bucks a pop, you know, you can just go out and pick salmon berries in the fall and you'll have tons of vitamin C. Now, what's interesting is, is your body readily absorbs iron, maybe 20% of an iron pill. Just if you took an iron pill, you're only going to absorb about 20% of that pill. Now, if you have vitamin C with it, you'll absorb 80% of that pill, your body will. So having seal meat and seal oil and berries afterwards is just incredibly incredibly healthy um so we were we, just talking about the the blueberries because i wanted to get a gallon of them before i went home yeah and i got a gallon of them last year and i ate about a quarter of them and then uh all my roommates ate the rest of them yeah so they were gone uh so i'm looking for for a gallon now but they are up here uh most folks are picturing the ones you get down in the lower 48 where they're pretty small. Yeah. These are like blueberries on steroids. Yeah. There's some real big ones up here. They are, and they're just a different quality than the ones you get from the store that are man-made, you know, and farmed and, you know, genetically modified, I guess you could say, you know. Um, ours actually have taste and flavor, and I mean, so we, we mix blueberries and we have, for so for a dessert, if you're going to come into my house for we call it nikhipak. Nikhi means meat. Bak means real. Real food, real meat. So if you're coming to my house, we'd have the seal oil on a plate, on the whole bottom of your plate. And then you have, you know, um, roasted caribou on there. You'd have some carrots. You have some apples with the seal oil, which is really good. And uh, of course, your uh, seal meat, your dried fish or salmon, even a baked salmon you put on there and you eat it. And so you eat all of this stuff, right? And even uh, kimchi, Eskimos love kimchi and seal oil. Uh, beluga whale, the muktuk, the skin on the outside, you dip that in there with some mustard and that's super good. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, you finish it with a cup of tea and then some berries. And the way we do our berries, you mix maybe blueberries and salmon berries in a bowl, carnation milk in there. Um, and then you just add a couple of teaspoons of sugar and man, you're good to go. Um, you could add some sourdough to it, which is wild rhubarb. And uh, that's that's super healthy too. One cup of that, of that rhubarb has the same amount of vitamin A as 156 carrot sticks. So, I mean, when you eat that real food, not a DiGiorno pizza or <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chick banquet chicken, right? You're eating real food, and it, it's just it's just incredibly nourishing to you. It's satisfying. Can you give us the word again? You said meat, real, but what's the? Yeah, nikki. Nikki is to eat. And uh, back is is uh, real, real. So you're eating real food, like um, uh, the the sun. Even nani back is uh, real light. You know, not fake light. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So even our inu back. That's what we call ourselves. We're not. We don't call ourselves Eskimos. We our, our tribe is called inu back, and inu means person. Back means real. The real people. Um, most of the tribes in Alaska, that's what their name translates to, whether it's the Diné people in the interior, your uh, Athabascans, or Yupiks, Siberian Yupiks, Aleuts, uh, almost even the Navajos, the Diné people in the lower 48. Aborigines in uh, Australia, their name almost always translates to the real people. And I don't know how that happened, but that's just how it happened. That's what it is. You you keep pointing out the the nutrients and the um, the health of the food. Uh, growing up up here, that's got to be important to know what you're eating and what it's going to give you. What kind oh, yeah. of calories and energy you're going to get out of it? Yeah, super. I mean, it's 
everybody just knows you know a lot of people don't know the particular statistics like I do but um, I used to be a teacher and so that's why I know some of these things um, salmon our our chum salmon here have the second highest fat content than any other chums in the whole state right and it's just super oily and super fat chums up here in fact my father lives in Kenai right now he moved down that way and so we get reds from him you know but if you overcook them reds just 30 seconds or one minute and you're it's dry you know uh, it's not like a chum where there's a little bit of leeway if you overcook it it's still it's fine it's gonna be oily still mm -hmm. you know and it's just super good man and the best way I like chum my wife makes a, a cheesy salmon and uh, so you bake your salmon with some seasonings but only about three quarters of the way in the oven your fillet and then she makes this stuff with mayonnaise and chives and stuff like that you know and uh, cheddar cheese shredded cheddar cheese and uh, you put that on top of the fillet and put it back in the oven to broil and when that cheese just crusts on the top man you got incredible salmon incredible salmon making my mouth water that's good stuff dude you can't stop well now i'm going to ask you and hopefully my my better half's not going to listen to this part because uh her spirit animal is a beluga oh he's <laughs> in love with beluga whales but I, i'd like it if you could take me through your very first beluga hunt the day yeah you could could you lay that out for us yeah i was a kid in sasolik you know there's a lot of belugas across there and they used to do try to do drives into the into a bay um, and so, of course, I was with my, uh, the Gallahorn family one time. We're trying to do a drive into the bay. And there'd be 20, 30 other boats, you know, trying to herd beluga into a bay to get them. And it's, they're just very difficult to get. Um, and so, you know, some boats will get some and some will not. But either way, all boats do the teamwork of that. And then everybody gets pieces and parts, you know. Um, a lot of times we'd get belugas in nets. We set nets just like we set a salmon net. A um, little bit different, you use styrofoam floats so they think they're icebergs, and they think they're just floating through icebergs and they get caught, uh, 11 inch mesh, shark webbing. Um, and so that's a good way to catch belugas. Uh, the last little hunt I was in, because we have such shallow water and the belugas follow these salmon and these herring in. Um, and so right up at the uh, entrance of the sandbars out there is where you'll find a lot of belugas. They've gotten, um, they're very shy in terms of sound. And so when I was a kid in, in the 70s and 80s at Sosolik, 15 miles away, we only had one jet a day, you know, one jet. We didn't have bearing air and all these planes coming every day. And across there, when, the, when you got an east wind, you can hear four wheelers in town. You can hear motorcycles in town. You can hear a taxi honking its horn 15 miles across the bay, right? You can hear all that all day. And when that jet takes off, yeah, that 747, 737, you hear that at Sosolik. And now we have, you know, two flights a day where we used to before COVID, you know, and bearing airplanes. And just, it's just incredible, too much noise now. And so there's, the belugas don't hang out as like, like they used to in our bay. Um, and even if they do, they're just really secretive now. You can't really find them. Not many people get them anymore. Mm -hmm. Except through nets, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when they when you pull that up, you said that everybody shares it. Yeah. I assume everybody shares the work too. It's got to be a lot of work cleaning a fish that big. Yeah, it is. Uh, you got you know whole families will come and and help cut it. They cut them into these little diamond squares. You boil them in a big fifty five gallon drum, kind of cut in half mm -hmm. on a fire, uh, and then so you boil them and then you hang them to kind of dry in these squares. You can kind of see it online how the Eskimos did it and. Uh, once they dried enough, then you can put them in your seal oil buckets where they're not going to get freezer burn any time of the year. You just pull out a little six inch by six inch square and then you cut that up for everybody and eat it with mustard. And Man, that's, <laughs> that's the best. That's good stuff. So you give your wife some mustard. And tell her that's her, her spirit animal condiment. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> that's going to go over really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what about what got you into fishing? Oh, well, my father did years ago. Of course, he uh, had a permit and a boat, wooden boat, mostly wooden boats back there in the old days. Hardly any uh, aluminum boats. Uh, fiberglass was just coming to its own, but mostly wooden boats, you know. And uh, I started when I was about 10 years old, 12 years old, somewhere in there. 
Uh, before that, I was stocking shelves at the local grocery store, you know, for peanuts. And But uh, as soon as I got into commercial fishing with my father, then we started making some money. So I uh, fished with him. And back then, it was really hard fishing. It was every day. There wasn't as many salmon, so you had to fish twice as hard. It wasn't eight-hour periods every other day like we're doing now. It was, you know, 16-hour periods, 12-hour periods, and uh, just hard, hard work, a lot of current. Uh, and not much fish, so worked really hard for a little bit. Yeah, the last couple of years there's been quite a bit of fish up here. Oh yeah, this is this year is just way off base. Yeah, yeah. lowest in 28 years. Yeah. So, but the last couple of years. Now, when you come when you come up to the dock every day, you got your kids with you. Yeah. How was that experience? Oh man, I'll tell you, it's it's different than my father fishing with my father. It was a lot of cussing, you know, and. You know, he's he's more impatient. You know, he's about the paycheck. So and uh, and so yeah, there's a really fast learning curve. How do you take a flounder out real fast? Should you pull the salmon through forward or should you try to, you know, gill it? Uh, just all that stuff. You got to know way ahead of time, because he was so impatient and uh, so you know you never want to get him mad. You work hard. You work fast. But it taught it. It really gave me a work ethic. You know, I could have been stocking shelves of my whole, you know, junior high and high school years, but that wouldn't have really taught me a whole lot. Uh, so, but fishing, I'll tell you, you work hard and, and, and I want to teach my kids that. Nowadays, they live in a, a day where there's video games and phones and things like that and gadgets. And, you know, it's it, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to get them out of the house, but it's so rewarding once they do, especially once they start getting some money and, you know, spending it on hot chips and video games <laughs> mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but yeah they they uh, they don't mind the hard work yeah what was your greatest childhood memory of fishing oh and it uh, doesn't have to be commercial fishing you can... yeah i mean there's a ton of them i mean you know i fished years ago my father fished with a fella named larry and and uh, he was a hoot he was just a character kind of a guy you know and he'd my father would pick him up at six in the morning and Larry would always, that's when he had cups back then, coffee mugs, but no covers, you know, he didn't invent those, I guess. And so he would always come into the truck at six in the morning and there were no paved roads. We got paved roads now. It was pothole roads, right? <laughs> yeah. And we'd fish down at the base. And so you got, you know, 10 miles of going through potholes and Larry always comes into the car with, uh, or the truck with. A, a full cup of coffee and my dad would say doggone it Larry <laughs> you know we got to get to our nets why why you keep coming in with a full cup and it's spilling on him every bounce <laughs> and he's trying to sip it and he's burning his it every morning it was like that he it was just the same so if anything we always got a kick out of Larry you know uh, the tourists would come down on the beach there was an old sod house where the tourist bus would would go and uh, so anyways um, Larry you know he does kind of make fun of tourists when they come up and he, he would show them a salmon from the boat you know when, right, right, right there on the beach and this bus would stop and tourists would come out and start taking pictures and he'd pull up another salmon you know a bigger salmon and they'd go ooh and they'd come down he'd kind of wave them down let them take pictures of these big salmon and and then of course it was only to bait them so that he could throw fl flounders at them <laughs> He'd say, now, boys, and we'd be hiding with a handful of flounders. We'd start throwing them at the tourists. And I look back at it now, and I'm thinking, how disrespectful we were. But that's just it was what, fun then. That, uh, that's just Larry for you, you know. You do what Larry did, and he chucked flounders. And it, at first, the tourists would look at you like, uh, is this a joke? But then they realized, this is not a joke. Let's get back in. <laughs> and every day, Larry said, boys, get the flounders. Tourists are coming. Get the flounders. So you start saving them. When you're oh, picking yeah. that net, you're oh, like, yeah. There's, it's like yeah, collecting <laughs> snowballs. Yeah. <laughs> so those are, you know, fun memories, I guess, of fishing. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, I think, you know, as a kid, we... We never even thought about it as work. It's just something that you do as a family. We never thought about how hard a work it is. Um, and I remember um, towards the end, of, and, and we never got paid like throughout the season. You know what I mean? From my from my dad, we. It was the end of the season, the first year. I remember I was like 12 years old, and at the end of the season, my father comes into my bedroom and he hands me this wad of money, hundred dollar bills. I said, what is that? He said, that's your fishing pay this year. I said, oh, I, we get paid? <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, thousand dollars. I counted them, ten of them, and I'm like, and I've never even seen old. a. I never even had a one hundred dollar bill in my life. Now I got ten of them in my hand, and I thought, whoa, this fishing is incredible. This is the way to go. This is fast money, easy money, and so, you know, right away I went to the local Hanson store. There has been a, there was a little motorbike, a little XL fifty, you know, and I've been eyeing that sucker all summer. My friend had one. I really want. There was one left in that little shop. So as soon as he gave me that thousand, he, I asked him, well, what can I spend it on? He said, anything you want. I, I ran right over to that place, handed that. I said, how much for that motorcycle? He said, 900 something. So I gave him the whole thousand bucks. Drove out of there with that little XL50, right? Well, I didn't know about a clutch. <laughs> I had no clue how to drive a motorcycle, right. you know? Uh, and so it, it took me a few jerks to figure things out as I was going down the street, you know, and eventually that night i mean i i still didn't know how to drive it and we we're up on a big bluff back here a friend of mine and i and he was a pro with it he was going to the edge of this 20-foot bluff and and you know skidding like that making dirt fly off and he said you try lance <laughs> well i went we you know right to that edge with my brand new motorcycle and i thought oh crap i can't spin out i don't know how so i thought i'll put on the brakes i pulled in the clutch instead of the brakes and i'm still going over <laughs> <laughs> and I just froze. In fact, I actually just went wee with the throttle. Put the and gas on higher. Put the gas on. The next thing you know, I'm flying over that 20 foot bluff, man. And I landed face first. Uh, I had a, two earfuls of dirt. My nose and my mouth, my whole mouth was stuffed with dirt. That's how bad I, I, I landed in this stuff. Uh, of course, I got, I got, it was okay. My friends were up there looking at me, you know, and I was pretty tough back then. And, they were wondering if they should laugh, and I said, go ahead and laugh. <laughs> so uh, my poor motorcycle, though, my brand new investment, the handlebars were turned completely one way, but my wheel was straight. <laughs> and so that's how I drove home. <laughs> I messed all my fishing money up, but I mean, I got it fixed, you know, but that was, a, that was the first time I ever got paid and enjoyed it anyway. Yeah. You know, people in the lower 48 <clears throat> hearing about, subsistence fishing and and it's different it's a different life down there yeah. than it is up here yeah and and you mentioned your kids video games and, and things are are you keeping them i know you're taking them fishing but are, how are you keeping them involved with your heritage oh all the time taking them hunting just took them out the other day uh fly fishing up fish creek and letting them learn the country learn the land uh, but my kids they hunt and they trap with me uh, my daughter Cassidy traps beaver behind town with me and Tyler and Cody. Uh, my other two girls, Melissa and uh, Savannah, they shot moose and caribou before. And so I have three girls, Melissa, Savannah and Cassidy. And those three girls are really good hunter girls, you know. And then, of course, I got my two boys and now they're, they're, they're doing just as good as the girls. So uh, er every few weeks, there's always something new here in Kotzebue. You know, always something new to get. Ne next, right now is moose. Well, yeah. Fishing, and then moose. Yeah. And then caribou. Yep. <laughs> yep. So right now, just, just we're gonna, as soon as we get done commercial fishing, we'll stock up on the subsistence fish. Right. Put a bunch of salmon fillets in the freezer. We'll make batches and batches of smoked fish from now till September. Uh, another week or so left, and then. Uh, but yeah, we're picking blueberries right now, and it's duck, ducks and geese are moving south. When I'm at the mouth fishing every morning, six o'clock, them geese wake up and head south right now. And so it'll be goose hunting at the end of August and beginning of September. And then of course, moose right in that period and caribou around the 15th of September. So uh, usually about uh, October 1st, that's when we start hunting seals out on the, in the bay here. They're coming out of the river. They've been eating salmon up the Notak and Kobuk rivers and they all come out in the fall and so we chase them with boats in shallow water. You can see their wakes, kind of like jaws, and you just follow them and shoot them, harpoon them. And so after the seals, it's trapping season. We start with fox and move on to lynx, muskrats, beavers, otters, minks, lynx. Uh, later on, move up further in and get martens and wolverines and wolves. Um, so it just never stops you know you get into March you get into shooting bears and fishing for sheepfish April is sheepfish and geese uh, seals on top of the ice so it just never stops it's a full season of 
catching animals. Always something new. It, it, it kind of have to be, you know. And so my kids, they go out with me. And, uh, and even as commercial fishing, um, it's a little bit more easy, I guess. I'm easing them into it. I'd like them to like it, you know. I want them to like fishing. Um, it's hard work, but it's worth it. And so I'm not like my what my father used to be. There was a lot of yelling and there was a lot of impatience, you know. I'll try to, I have to try to remind myself to say, and even let them explore and taking out a salmon, you know. I want to say, hey, that's a pull through, you know, or whatever, or twist it this way. It's, they twist it the wrong way, you know, and it's twisted in the net. Mm -hmm. And I say, try the other way. <laughs> so I'm having a little bit more patience with them than my father did with me so that they're just, they're, someday they'll go out and they'll just enjoy setting a few shackles and pulling a few hundred fish, making a thousand bucks, you know, and just enjoy the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I hope to accomplish with them. Anyway. You've had some pretty nice weather to enjoy those days this year. Yeah. I mean, it's been yeah. gorgeous days. Yeah. Hardly. And you did a lot of cabin for spots this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, some, some, some folks with cabin boats, and they're camping and sleeping on those good spots, you know. So those are the ones who really make the most money. But I don't have a cabin on my boat. My son Tyler and I, we, we did try to go secure the point one night, and... Uh, but uh, west wind at 20 knots, and we have a tarp with a couple of lean-to poles, and it was just flapping and yeah. crazy, you know. And we, we spent the night, we did it, and we did okay, you know. But it's just not the same as these guys in cabin boats. They got little Mr. Buddy heaters in there, and they're making coffee, and they got Wi-Fi. And, uh -huh. you know, shoot, I'm out in the elements, man. Yeah. That's, that's rough. So... Mm -hmm. How much of your diet, your family's diet, do you think comes from subsistence? If there was a percent you put on it? Maybe 70%, I guess. Yeah. Right now we have five freezers in my house and they're all pretty much full. Seal oil, you know, five gallon buckets of seal oil. And just from one bearded seal, you can get 20 gallons, 25 gallons of oil. Now, is trading still a, a deal? Huge deal. Yeah, the native people here are very relational people. We all live, as you can see, 10 feet apart from each other. It's not like the cities in the lower 48 where, you know, you have space, you have yards, you have everything, right? But here is such a small, tight-knit community. And so um, one of our Inupiaq values, we have values as Inupiaq people, and one of our values is sharing. And so when you hunt and trap and fish, your first animal of every kind you give away to an elder. That's just our tradition. That's our value. So your first moose that you get, you give it away. You can give it in pieces to elders and to widows, but you have to give it away. Your first chum salmon, your first dolly, your first grayling, your first sheepfish, your first mallard duck, your first pintail duck, your first caribou. First seal? First seal. Everything. First bearded seal, first spotted seal, first ring seal, first beluga. Um, and you, you normally you want those things. You, you want to be proud of them. But it's such an important value in our culture that, yeah, you might want that, but you have to give it away. And what you learn um, right off the bat is that sharing is so valuable, so valuable. A lot of times I used to share to this one particular elderly woman, uh, Fanny Mendenhall, and she didn't speak too too great of English, and I would bring her ducks or bring her caribou, right? And and she say, Kalurak, that's my Eskimo name, Kalurak, next time you go, you're going to have lots of lucky. That's what she said, you're going to have lots of lucky. And, you know, over the years, I had lots of lucky and did really well. And, um, you know, a saying, even in the Bible, it, you know, it talks about your first fruits and your tithes and giving those away. And God will bless you with more. And, the, and it is true that if you give, you'll receive, um, you know. So it's been a really good uh, lesson for my children and for me over the years. Because not only do you just give that first animal away in your whole life, what it teaches you is you just keep doing it every year. Every year you just continue to give, continue to give. Continue. Well, it helps the elders and someday you're going to be one. Yeah, yeah. And I hope that someday I'm an old man and some young buck comes to me after commercial fishing with a nice fat trout for the day, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it perpetuates year after year, generation by generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With your dad being white, 
and from the lower 48. Did he encourage you in your in your uh, values? Oh yeah, definitely. He, I mean, he just he knew they were valuable, and so you know, my grandmother was pretty tough, and so my Eskimo grandma, and uh, my mom's mom, and so she would really, she's the one who would say, "You got to give this away, you got to give that away," you know, and so my father just kind of followed suit with it, um, and so yeah, it's a great great life to live great values respect our values are respecting um, elders respecting others respecting nature um, and then of course uh, knowledge of language we try to learn our language uh, sharing humility hard work uh, cooperation uh, avoidance of conflict is a big one with us and that that doesn't mean that you shouldn't fight somebody what that means is you should communicate with somebody so that you don't come to fists and death you know um, that's one of our values family roles is a value spirituality is a value we have 17 particular values that elders kind of laid out years ago that that most everybody follows and we kind of keep ourselves in check you know if you're not respectful of fishing you know you're sitting too close to somebody you're corking somebody off somebody will say hey what about respect for others or whatever you know maybe it might be an elder you're cutting off hey what about respect for elders you know last year <clears throat> there was an elder that passed it was a it was an older woman and we had several fishermen that wouldn't fish until mm. they she was buried yeah they were preparing gathering things for the family yeah. um, can you explain that portion of it is that common Oh, it's definitely common. I mean, there's no uh, undertaker here in town, right? When somebody passes away, uh, people are immediately at that home giving them soup and food and praying for them, hanging, you know, just their presence is good enough to be with them. And even during the COVID season, it's that way. You know, normally you shouldn't, right? Six feet apart, nobody visiting and whatever, but we're so relational that we, we kind of have to do it. And so... Yeah, uh, people will go visit those homes. We'll dig the graves ourselves, you know, six feet in the ground. And it's hard with this permafrost right now. In the winter, it's hard. Uh, but you, you have to use jackhammers when you go down a couple of feet, you know, because it's thawed out in the summer about two feet down, maybe one feet down. And you got to use jackhammers to get the rest of it, you know. And so it's a, it takes a ton of work. We have our own people making caskets, you know. You don't buy them. It's too much money. Those folks are crazy. In Anchorage, selling you five grand for a casket. Mm -hmm. They're only going to last you 30 minutes on the ground, you know, so people build their own. We have our own casket makers. Um, and so everybody pitches in to make sure that that this family is taken care of so that if their family member passes away, everybody else in the community will help and pitch in as well. So I remember she wanted to be buried at camp. Yeah. So it was a it was a, a, a big thing for everybody to be in the boats and headed that way and yeah. And uh, and they dug the they dug the grave the day of. Yeah. It was Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's just how it is up here. You know, things are way more important than money. And uh, money will come and go, but relationships are forever and so you keep those relationships nice and tight and good, you know. Yeah. And we are and you guys have heard me mention it on uh, the last episode with John Ray, but we are in the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the winters like for you guys here? Lately, they've been pretty warm because of climate change. And, uh, you know, two years ago, our ocean didn't freeze further out at the shifting ice. Our Cotsby Sound, this close area, will, will freeze and it'll get stuck to the ground because we have sandbars nearby. But outside of those sandbars is shifting ice. And so when I was in high school, of course, we had super thick ice even out there. Um, you can go to Shishmaref and, and uh, fish for crabs through the ice. They would have uh, oh, pantyhose. They have ladies' pantyhose with spark plugs in there and everything to weight it down. And then you lower that in a hole, you know, just a regular 12-inch diameter hole or so, and, uh, you know, 30, 40 feet of water and with, a, with a rope. And then, of course, the, and then bait inside of those pantyhose, tomcod, smelts, things like that. Crabs come over to try to get those, and then their spines get stuck in the pantyhose, right? <laughs> right. Pretty soon, you you know, you feel tugs on your line. And you're thinking, oh, I'm getting some animals. And so you start pulling it up and 
Sure enough, there's four or five crabs stuck to your lady's pantyhose <laughs> coming and, up. And these are king crab up here. King crab. Huge. So they're, they're, a lot of our listeners are big king oh yeah. crab, crab, you know, yeah. why they watch the TV show and, and stuff. And So that's a unique way. We've never heard of anybody <laughs> catching king crab with oh, pantyhose. Yeah. Pantyhose, man. P- pantyhose, spark plugs, and herring. And you just load up. The thing is they see that surface coming and they start to try to let go, but they're just so stuck, you know. Uh, sometimes guys will even have like a big rake and so when that does come close they put that rake underneath just to in case any do any do come off and they pull them up and they just keep doing that all day and so you know you can catch quite a bit of crab like that and so but that's when the ice was thick you cannot go to Shishmaraf anymore you can't go to deer you can't go to Shamaso Island uh, you just can't do that anymore um, again two winters ago uh, it was so warm that that ocean stayed ocean the whole winter. You can take a boat 14 miles away from here at Cape Blossom and go right around that shore fast ice to Sisolik. Um, and that is completely unheard of in, the, in, in all of our history. All of our history, never has the ocean stayed open all year, all winter. So climate change is a real deal. Um, even when we're hunting bearded seals in the spring, we, we use in the internet now. We look at uh, ice images, satellite ice images, and we see where there's white ice and we see where it's moving and we say, well, I'm gonna go here today. And then you go to those big chunks of ice and they're there uh, because it updates about every four hours, every six hours, and that's and how you, you get your bearded you seals. Mm-hmm. And you have to because our window now is so fast. You only have two weeks of hunting bearded seals nowadays. And you there's know. no limit on those either, right? No. Uh-uh. As a native, you can yeah, all the sea mammals, there's no limit. I can get 100 polar bears if I wanted to, but I don't need them, you know. So, yeah, you can get as many bearded seals, ring seals, spotted as you want. Uh, but, you, some, you know, you just mostly take what you need. Or if you're hunting for other people, you take as many as your boat can carry. And so that's what a lot of people will do sometimes is the other people will give them gas, elders or grandmothers, and say, hey, could you pick me one up too, you know, and... So boats will come back, even though their family might only need three that year, they might come back with five or six uh, and then give to these elders, drop them off, and those people have families that they give to. How many caribou do you get in a year? Oh, I think about 10 or 12. Um, We get five or six in the fall when they're nice and fat and their hides are good, and we save those hides for cot jacks, for mattresses for the winter. Um, And then uh, usually get the rest throughout the winter. As they're coming in November, they'll cross the ice. As they're coming through in December behind town. So that's as many as my family needs. Now, we'll shoot a few more for elders and other people that need them, you know, as time comes along. So, and if somebody says, hey, can you get me a few caribou? And you go out behind town, and they're usually there all winter, and uh, you get a few more, bring them to these people. Now, Would you change anything about the lifestyle that you've been brought up in? Oh, no. Heck no. We, I was just talking to a couple guys. There were some hunters on the beach today and uh, from the lower 48, from Idaho, and uh, I forget where else, but uh, they were coming up here to hunt caribou, and, you know, they just talked about how beautiful it was up there in the Arctic where they were, Peniak Lake, up the Notak River, and the caribou coming through, the bears that were there. Uh, they just never seen anything like it, you know, and they just loved it, and they want to come back. And so we talked about all this stuff that you and I are talking about. And, uh, you know, uh, those poor guys got to go back to their little suburbs, you know. <laughs> and uh, they, I said, well, what do you guys got going on when you go back? And they said, well, we got deer season and elk season. And, you know, that's pretty much it. And then a 40-hour uh, work week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, check their trail cams, climb their little tree stand, you know, and get their one or two bucks. But, man, here it's... You know, nonstop. I told them when the caribou come across in November, right across that ice, they're coming in the thousands. There'll be a line of a thousand caribou coming. Right when we're basting a turkey at Thanksgiving, I look out my window and big old line of caribou are coming. And so I get my kids, we go on the hills behind town, we let them cross the ice and they start climbing these bluffs that we have on our peninsula. They come in these little valleys and and uh, as soon as they come up over the top, you know, you wait for a good good fat female and you shoot her the ones at the bottom they're still coming they don't know what happened at the top right 
So they come up and they look around and they say, what's going on? Why is Susie dead? And boom, and Jill is dead. You know what I mean? Now Bob took off. He's like, what the heck? You know? And uh, now you got Susie and Jill dead. And next thing you know, Janet comes up. What's going on with that? And bang. And then that one's dead. And it just, it's nonstop. And I get my three or four. My kids get their three or four. And we work on them up there and haul them into town. Uh, Bob's still going. Bob's still going. Yeah, he's he's a lucky one. We don't hunt the bulls in the rut, you know. Uh, that's that's it's so different when we watch the Outdoor Channel. My kids and I, my family, I think many families up here love hunting and fishing so much uh, that everybody here watches uh, Outdoor Channel, and it's just night and day difference, a night and day difference, you know. We'll watch. My kids will watch these. We don't watch them too much because it's a bunch of baloney. You watch these bass fishermen in these boats in these tournaments, right? And they're catching these fish and just ringing them up and dropping them in their boat or they're taking them off. And my my kids were little, my boys, and they'd say, Dad, they just let the fish go. <laughs> they wait it and they let it go, Dad. What's wrong with these people, you know? Yeah. They can't figure these people out, you know? Or when they look at a person who just caught a, a, a buck, right? And this person gets out and number one, they're shaking and they can't breathe and they, they're they so excited. And my, my kids are saying, dad, why are they like that? I say, they just don't get as much as we do. We passed that stage when we were eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> when you get 15 and you got a hundred caribou in your you life. You clean them and you got Yeah, it. it's just, okay, it's another thing, you know? No, you don't go crazy. Um, and then they'll say, dad, why are, why are they holding the head and counting the points? You know, we just leave our antlers in the field. And, and so I said, well, this is what they do. You know, they, they, so they, they keep the antlers and trophies and they put them on their wall. And so we leave, we leave our caribou antlers in the field and you let them sit out there for a few years. When they turn white, they dry out and now you can get them. Now you can cut them up and use them for ulu handles, knife handles and uh, jewelry, you know. And you they, actually they, do see stacks of them around town yeah. where someone's saving them to, for them to turn white. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's just so interesting, so strange for my kids to watch Outdoor Channel sometime. And, you know, it's just a completely different way of life. Also, it just seems like there's a lot of competition, you know, down there. It's, well, we've got our stand and there's neighbors over there, you know, they keep, they keep uh, encroaching and poaching. And here... When we're hunting, we let people know we're catching. You know what I mean? You call people on the VHF and you say, hey, the caribou are crossing at the egg. You come well, get them. There's a thousand of them. Yeah, so. <laughs> come get them. And people come and that's how it is. It, there's no my place, your place, my stand, this and that. And, you know, um, there's no crops. We don't make crops. <laughs> you know, we, you just, we see thousands of dollars invested these tractors and the crops and the stands and the trail cams and all this work and then it's oh i got my buck in november you know and uh it's just not like that for us here because fortunately for us we just reap you know what i mean there's no sowing for us not like a farmer farmer sows and a farmer weep reaps uh we just reap uh, these animals they all come up at a certain time we don't feed the salmon we don't farm our fish we don't feed caribou and moose and it's it, it's so strange and so we're not a farming culture at all it's just constantly getting in fact there was an old chapter of a book and it's I think the title of it was always getting ready I think it was a Nick Jans book uh, it's because we're always getting ready always for the next thing the next season so right now you're getting ready for hunting. Yep, yep. Getting our decoys ready for the geese, you know. Getting buckets ready for berries. Getting our smokers ready for the salmon here shortly. Emptying our freezers, you know. Making sure they're ready for a moose when a moose comes around. Always getting ready. Non-stop. All year. And, and, wouldn't, so, and wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. I'm the luck. We're, we are the luckiest people on the whole planet, I believe. You know, uh, I just, I feel uh, sad sometimes when I watch Outdoor Channel and 
I mean, I'm glad for people. If I lived in the lower 40, I'd be doing the same, exact same thing. I'd have a food plot. I'd have tractors because I want deer attracted to my land. I understand them and I get them. I do. Um, it's just I'm so glad. Uh, you know as well as I do that when you leave here, you're going to go into civilization as we call it. And when you fly over Seattle and you'll see all that fog. and But when the fog clears... It's just going to be miles and miles and miles of plotted land, you know. You're going to look down and you're going to see somebody's swimming pool. And you're going to see all of these little suburbs and curves and streets and a football field once in a while and a, a baseball field over here and a, 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 J, a, a Walmart store over here, right? And, and you're going to see those things. And it's nonstop for miles. And I'm, I look down at all that and I go... That poor fellow right there. <laughs> that poor guy is in the middle of all that crap. Yeah. There ain't no deer going to come to his land <laughs> or a turkey or... What does he live for? Right. What does... So he goes to where he comes home. What does he do? You know? He's not commercial fishing like me and making... You know, he's not getting food and putting a fresh salmon on his, his dinner tonight. No. What, what is his life? It's all different, huh? What does he do? Well, uh, hey, Bob, do you want to go golfing this weekend? <laughs> or do you want to go to a, you know, Mariner game or something? I don't know. And I just wonder, whoa, just a completely different life. You even go further from there into eastern Washington where there are not many houses. But what you do see are these huge circles and rectangles and you know, squares and things like that, you know. Uh, just the rest of the land from eastern Washington on over is all plotted, you know. Where do you go? What do you do? You might see a stand of trees well, very once in a while. And you go, well, whoever's house is next to that is pretty lucky. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Uh, yeah. Well, you got that all around here. Yeah. I mean, it takes about three minutes to drive clear across this town. Yeah. It's a mile long, half a mile wide. We live all close-knit together so we can keep all the land as pristine as possible so that caribou do come three miles behind town so that there is a moose. I can go back and we can go find a moose right now on a four-wheeler behind town if you search hard enough. Um, and so it, it is the best life, you know. Springtime, you can get king crab. We use sheepish for bait. For those of you crabbers online, we get the brown kings, big brown kings, and we get them in June. They come in to molt and we use sheepish for bait and uh, these uh, four by four on the bottom and two by two on the top uh, welded crab pots with these triggers so that come in. Pyramid kind of shape, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, the, our water's not very deep, maybe 40 feet. Uh, you lower that down in there and you got a big old sheepish. It's like a Florida tarpon. It's a big white fish that we get in the winter. And you, you have a dog snap hanging that at the top, and the crab come in, and it's a little Hotel California. They come in, they can't go out. <laughs> you know, they can't come out. Now, do you keep some of those, too, for the winter, or do you, are those kind of a feast? And just, You better kind of eat them. They don't last too long unless you, you come home, cook them, and then shell them right away, and then you put them in vacuum seal bags. And then you freeze them. Then they'll, and then you freeze them, and they'll last that way. But I tried so many times to boil them and keep them in the shell. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of can't do that um, unless you do. You take up so much more room, too. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot more room. And, and then it's hard to backpack a king crab. Oh, yeah, yeah. You it doesn't work no, very well. It's not going to happen. <laughs> no. no. We tried that. Those spines would just pop oh, right yeah. through. First year, you know, December comes around Christmas. Oh, we're going to have king crab and turkey. Shoot. It's all freezer burned and dried and shriveled up. And you're like, what the heck? <laughs> Yeah. Well, Lance, is there anything else you want to share with us before we wrap this up? Is there something that you would like to share with us? Uh, you know, I fished in Igigik one time. That was a neat experience uh, with Rick Tennyson out in Dillingham. And, uh, you know, the, the most difficult part there was this the sleep deprivation. And 16-hour uh, days on this boat, you know, and you're out there for a month. And you, you get a lot of reds and you get, you know, a lot of fish. And, and that's fine. It's, but, boy, that sleeping... De sleep deprivation is crazy over there you know you get nuts really and uh but made some good money it was interesting because there was a difference in fishery you know for uh, between us and that and the sockeye fishery there they were getting a buck five a pound i think at peter pan seafoods and we made a ton of money 
I was on a boat with a few other guys and Rick Tennyson's a hard captain and we worked super hard and uh, that was that was the hardest fishing in my life you know here it's pretty easy but over there it's non-stop you know drift fishing mm -hmm. you set three shackles you pick one end up after you check it set it on the other side go to that second shackle go through it pick it up set it on the other side with those d-rings uh, and it's like that all day long and you just you're basically a fish picking machine is what you are yeah that's it you are a fish picking machine and and then you don't get much sleep and you do that for a whole month you know and uh, you get used to it I think after a while but you get really spoiled here I'll tell you well it seems like we're getting spoiled well for me the this day in between kills me yeah because I don't I don't go do the berry picking although I did yesterday yeah but I don't go do the berry picking or, or the prepping for my smokehouse or the yeah. getting ready for my caribou you know I'm here waiting for the next day to, to, to fish yeah and so uh, for me this this has been a very tough year in Casa Butte because of the, the yeah. downtime between I would rather just go every day yeah and, and it's been that way in the past but this year it hasn't no. and it makes it difficult yeah. But while you were while you were talking about the time in Bristol Bay, I had a listener write in from uh, Queensland, Australia. Uh, Dale Price is his name, and he had a couple questions more centered upon um, the lifestyle of living on a boat. And as a dr mm -hmm. drifting in Bristol Bay, you do live on those boats. You do not go yeah. into town. So a couple of the questions that we'll ask you that were from Dale is who's responsible to clean the boat while at sea, or oh. do they clean the boat? Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of not a lot of cleaning. Uh, you know, we have uh, big bales and stuff uh, uh, where you, you keep your fish. Uh, but usually, the youngest, the two youngest folks on the boat will do any kind of cleaning and bay, you know, uh, running the uh, the pump, bilge pump, and things like that. So youngest youngest people. Well, what about the dishes and cooking? Yeah. Well, we had another guy do that because uh, a lot of us younger younger folks on the boat didn't know how to cook, right? And so Rick Tennyson had a deckhand, an older fella named Bob. And this is funny because we're in Igigik. The, the fishing had not started yet. And Bob is like, he's the cook for, for the whole time, right? He's old. He can't pick fish like us young people. So he is the cook. Well, Bob screwed up the first week, big time. And Rick had this long standing record that he never puked ever in the sea and that's a big deal right when you get when you're starting off you're gonna get your you, you know you're gonna puke rick never puked ever in his entire fishing life the main captain the michael jordan of the boat well guess what bob screwed that up <laughs> with that year that i fished he was supposed to make eggs and potatoes and onions right like this goulash kind of a mix or something but Everybody ate, and everybody's thinking, that's a strange tasting breakfast. It tasted kind of freaky, you know? We couldn't figure it out. Well, later on in that morning, Rick went out and puked. And he was so pissed. He'd come back into the house, the wheelhouse. He says, what in the hell did you make today, Bob? <laughs> he says, you ruined my record. You know I didn't puke my whole life. And now I'm puking. What's going on? What did you make? And he says, well, I made eggs. I made potatoes. He says, we don't have potatoes. He says, what do you mean you don't have potatoes? What did you use? And he says, these things. And he pulls out these things and these bulbs of garlic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just bulbs of bulbs of garlic, you know. Uh, so it was eggs, garlic, eggs, and garlic onions. Eggs, garlic, and onions. And, you know, it just... Oh my God, everybody was so sick and Rick messed up, you know. And so anyways, that, that was an interesting start to the season. Uh, of course, the other thing I found freaky on there was, well, you, 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 there's no bathroom on the boat, you know. And so the thing was, you have a five gallon bucket, it was your poop bucket, and you lowered it and you filled it half with water and you put it on the, and then you go, do your business. Yep. And, but there's, there's millions of boats zooming right next to you sitting right yeah. millions of yeah. them with ladies on them mm -hmm. and your bare butt is sticking out right yeah and so we had this young kid named breck little kid he's a junior higher at the time i remember or high school young high school anyways breck he did not want he was a shy young boy he can't put his old butt in a bucket in front of everybody like rick and bob and myself can so he will he goes in one of the holes 
One of the, one of the fish holds. <laughs> he drops himself, and he's a little guy. He's got to really jump to get out, right? So he puts the bucket down in there. He doesn't tell us. And we're wondering, what the heck happened to Brack, you know? Did he go overboard? And man, we're looking around, Brack, Brack, you know? Well, he can't come out. We closed that bin on, on top of him, you know? And he's yelling, and we, we can hear him. We can't we don't know where the heck Down he is. Bin. We're looking around the edge. Is he hanging off the edge? Where is this kid? Sure enough, uh, finally you can hear him pounding on the top of that bin, you know? Opened it up, and there's Brack down there with a, a bucket and a little poop hanging in there, <laughs> floating in there. Why are you doing it in there? That's where we put fish, you know. <laughs> I don't want to be seen. Yeah, I don't want to. These ladies are passing by. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Lance, uh, thanks for joining us today and, and sharing your, your life story or part of it. I know, I know there's so much more to it. Yeah. But um, how do you say goodbye? There's no goodbye in Eskimo. There is not. No. There's no word, word for goodbye. So what's, your, what's, the, what's, what's the saying of departure? Uh... I don't even know. We don't really say anything. We say uvlakun lu. Uh, uvlakun means tomorrow. Lu means and. So we say tomorrow. That's what we say. Yeah. No goodbyes. No. No goodbyes in Eskimo. And how do you say it again? Uvlakun lu. Uvlakun lu. Uvlakun lu. Okay, guys. That one. Uvlakun lu. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow. Yep. Thanks again, guys, for listening. And... Uh, uh, appreciate uh, everybody tuning in during this COVID time, especially it's been hard to get some recordings done. But um, email in your questions, and uh, and we'll get back to you. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to Galley Stories. We hope you like what the net brought in. Please leave us a review on iTunes, whether you like it or not. We're not fishing for compliments. Look us up on Facebook and Twitter, too, and reach out to us at galleystories at gmail.com.